It's time to make sports talk great again with Kurt Schilling and Steve Dace. Greetings and welcome to The Blaze, where each and every day, whether you are watching us here on The Blaze or listening via podcast or watching on YouTube, we talk sports. I am Steve Dace. He is World Series champion, future Hall of Famer, Kurt Schilling. We put 25 minutes on the clock, get to as many of the day's sports topics as we possibly can. Are you ready, Mr. Schilling? Oh, always ready. Then we begin now. So we've been having this ongoing conversation, uh, you and I, as a, I mean, you're a former player rep, obviously a world champion. So you're uniquely qualified to talk about what hasn't really been happening. Uh, this hot stove league in Major League Baseball and spring training is going to be open uh, across the majors by the time you and I come back on Monday. And yet over 100 free agents, including the two top prizes and the number one pitcher in uh, free agency, all remain unsigned. And so this has prompted a lot of discussions about the collective bargaining agreement, the collusion words been thrown around, etc. What I found was interesting is CBS Sports uh, used an analytic site known as Fangraphs, which essentially takes what a team accomplished that year and then what your contributions were to that team accomplishing it and then what that what that did to the overall value of a franchise in total, etc. Uh, and, and it tries to put a price tag on it. And here are a couple of examples from the last few seasons. So in 2016, Chris Bryant won the National League MVP. Cubs won the World Series. He made $1.05 million that year. But if you look at what the brand uh, increase to the Cubs overall was and Bryant's contribution, uh, he'd actually be worth like $63 million to the Cubs. For that year. For that year. Yeah. Uh, also in 2016, Francisco Lindor was a top 10 finisher in the MVP voting, uh, was a centerpiece for the AL pennant winning Indians. He made 580000 Fangraphs estimates he was actually worth closer to $44 million. Uh, <laughs> In 2017, Carlos Correa was uh, one of the most important players on the World Series champion Astros MVP caliber season uh, and then he had five home runs and 14 RBIs and 18 playoff games he made 535,000 that year he was probably worth closer to 41 million dollars and there's other examples yep. Let, let's say that their numbers are inflated by 50 percent which would be huge okay but let's say they're not either let's say they're only half right we're still talking about huge sums of money here so as you read through this study and as you're watching what takes place or what hasn't been taking place uh this hot stove league in major league baseball your reaction kurt Schilling, is what um i well it's it's funny i had an act this actual discussion with my agent when i had an agent um a long time ago, 20, 20 some years ago. And my agent used to tell me about, it was actually the first time I went to arbitration, which was, I think, 90, 92 to 93. And he used to say, listen, if I owned a team, I would renew your contract every single year until you hit arbitration. And then I would suffer the consequences mm -hmm. to save the money. Um, and that's some teams, some you're seeing some teams are kind of doing the most teams aren't right. I mean, because they want their athletes happy. And so, you know, but the, the fact of the matter is I'm a little bit farther away from it now. When I look at it, the who, who takes all the risk? The owners do. Right. The yeah. teams, yeah. right. I mean, yeah. what's the stat? One in every X thousand that gets drafted actually makes it to the big leagues, you know? Like, it's only about 48% of first-round picks in Major League right. Baseball ever get an at-bat in Major League this Baseball. Is, That's first-round picks. In many ways, part of this is capitalism. This mm -hmm. is the, the risk-reward. I right. mean, for all the, you know, all the millions that you just mentioned those players are worth, you could probably mention all the millions spent on developing players that never make it. it, it it's the risk-reward part. The, the, the arbitration system, the owners hate it, by the way. They absolutely hate it. I don't know if you saw uh, Trevor Bauer's comments after his last arbitration hearing, um, but it's one of the reasons why people don't go to arbitration. Why teams? Team, I know Theo Epstein has almost refused to go, ever. And I know a lot of other owners who had players who they refused to take to arbitration because in arbitration, the team has to tell you how bad you are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys can't handle that. I remember Billy and then Rankin ask you to report for spring training a month later. Yep. Yeah. Well, they Trevor said they spent the last ten minutes absolutely destroying his character in his arbitration hearing, and then, and he said, "I you know I understand it's all business, but there are very few." I remember Billy Ripken coming out and saying 
dropping multiple f bombs. I'd never want to play here again after his arbitration. It's a nasty thing, and, and and to hear your employer talk about how bad of a person you are or how bad of a player you're, which is what they have to do because this is always. I don't think a lot of people understand this isn't a a, a split the difference kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Arbitration is all about one number or the other. You win or you lose. And you've seen a couple record settlements in the last couple of weeks, too, 17, 18, 19 million dollars. But some other guys have won and it's been over 20 and and you're talking huge money. But that was always where they made it. The players made up the difference. Right. I mean, you, you, you make 550, you make 750, you make a million one. And then you're ready for arbitration and your salary goes up to if the team is done with they with what what, what they said they were going to do, which is keep you at minimum, you're going to get a huge bump. And that's what teams really don't like arbitration. The the fan graphs study, you know, it the numbers to me don't aren't right. And here's why. Because let's go to the Chris Bryant number of he made over just over a million dollars in 2016. Right. They're not factoring in what the deficit that he ran before he came to the majors right. and was a full-time contributor while they were still paying him as a high draft pick, you know, uh, to play for the Iowa Cubs instead. Okay. They're not factoring, factoring in the cost of special instructors, uh, training table, everything else that it took yep. that they, that they offered up the assets that right. they offered up to help Chris Bryant capitalize well, on his it's, talent. It's very but, much like the, the medical industry. And yes. I mean that, that why is a pill worth, you know, forty dollars. And the reason why is because you and I aren't paying out of our pocket, but a third party that can afford it. Right. Is. Well, it's also if you and I bought it ourselves, it'd be a dollar fifty. Right. Yeah. There's well, an, an X-ray is an X-ray is three hundred dollars because your insurance company is paying for it. If you and I were paying out of pocket, it would be thirty five dollars. Okay. Right. But um, here's the thing: the fan graph study, I think, while the numbers I think are way skewed because it doesn't count the preemptive investment each club makes. And right. and here's the thing too: the club's just not making that into Chris Bryant. But every player that didn't contribute, right. also, they had to pay that off as well. Okay, And that goes to what you were talking about. All the preemptive assumed risk is on yep. the teams. But what the fan graph study, I think, does articulate is that the owners have found a way a, a sort of around policing them or a way to police themselves. Uh, yep. And that is the new model of strip your team bear. The Astros did this, you know, after Biggio and Bagwell and all, the, all kinds of teams have fallen suit or, or, fall, or followed suit now. And the, my Tigers are trying to do it right now. All right. Strip your team bear for four or five years. Okay. Uh, find a good nucleus, have them all get good together. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then you get them on the cheap so that maybe if you need to add, you know, like the Cubs, uh, your boy, Theo Epstein added, um, uh, Hugh Darvish in pre agency at the end last yep. year. You go add that one or two big pieces you think you need, okay? Because the rest of your team is on the cheap. And then you just let those guys walk. You never pay them their huge free agent deal like what the Nats did with Bryce Harper. And then you just, you know, control out, delete, and reboot the system all over again. Yep. This is the way it seems to me as an outsider, Kurt. They have found a way around the fact they couldn't control themselves when you played. Am I wrong or well, right? This is, this is, I think you're, you're, uh, in many ways, you're right. This is what it's destroying the middle class. Mm-hmm. Is what they're doing. There, it's very, uh, and and it's it's done intentionally, and and that's why I think you're going to have. So, what do we mean by that? Just to quantify that for our viewers and listeners, well, I think what you're saying is everybody on the team. There's three or four guys on the team making twenty million or more. And then everybody else in the team is making a half to one and a half million. That's what you're talking right. about. Guys, are, who's, yeah, they, how many guys are making seven, eight, nine, ten million, for example? Right. That's what you're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that and and um, like I said, it, part of it. It, that's one of the reasons why I, I think there's going to be an issue with the next collective bargaining agreement. When does it come up? Uh, I believe it's at two years from now. Okay. Uh, I believe I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure, but um, it's going to come up. And I think it's one of the places where Tony Clark has to fix. I don't think he's been, or has done a great job to, to, to date uh, in keeping the players. And well, he hasn't simply because just look at the, at the lack of player movement. Anytime you introduce a financial system that dissuades uh, employees from seeking or getting, you know, better compensation and another, you know, it, it's just it's disenfranchising if I'm a player because they really are. Again, we're, we're pitchers and catchers are all showing up, and there are over a hundred players who it's were on incredible. rosters last year. Keep in mind and, and, why, to put that in perspective. Essentially, the equivalent of four. Opening day rosters in Major yeah. League Baseballs in Major League Baseball are vacant right now. 
Um, that be, of, that that gives you an idea of the amount of unsigned free agents at the moment. One final quick. Go ahead. You want to make, make another I, I, I point? I was going to say. You, I think you could also build a competitive, legitimate roster uh, in any division with the guys that are with mm-hmm. Machado and Harper and Keuchel and Kimbrel and I mean, it's it's insane. <laughs> What'll be fascinating is we need to sit here and wait for about another month and see how many of these guys sign one or two year deals for oh, yeah. three, four, five million now that teams are going to look to see that they've driven the market sufficiently down and and now try to fill out uh, you know the rest of their lineups. One last thing on this. So here again, this is where I love your intersection as because you've been the player rep. You've been the you've been the prized free agent. You were just getting into the prime of your career when you had the near extinction level event of the '94 cancellation that right. got rid of the World Series. You were a part of the of the era that brought the game back after that. All right, um, and yet you also you're also a committed capitalist. You acknowledge it's the it's the teams that are making all the taking all the preemptive right. risk here, so they should therefore reap the pre you know the the most reactive uh, reward from that preemptive risk. Right. So you see both sides of this what is something if tony clark called you up and said kurt if, if, what could i sit down and do with rob manfred right now in the next 12 months because you need to do it now before right. you get to the right. final 12 months when all the emotion and the politicking right. starts right okay so what could we do like gene up sean paul tagliabue did for 20 years in the nfl what conversation could i have with rob manfred in the next 12 months that gets us before we get to the when when when, when inertia kicks in and we're going to have a work stoppage just because the egos and the headlines are involved now what could he do well here's the challenge in many ways uh the, the and again I, i'm only introducing this because you understand the language um the owners are liberal in the sense that it's very hard to get something back once you give it mm-hmm. um the first the only thing i would be concerned about right now is is the uh the dissuasion of player movement in the rules the compensation for signing you're penalizing people for for spending money by by taking away draft picks, uh, I I would get rid of every barrier to player movement that I could. Uh, I don't have a problem with six year free agency and super two arbitration and all the stuff that goes around in, in, involved in that. But that's that's part of the reason that they're doing what they're doing because they're doing exactly what you said. I'm not going to sign this guy for for six point eight million for five years. I'm just instead I'm going to put this arb this this minimum salaried guy who's Probably just as good, if maybe maybe a little bit worse, uh, and then I can keep my draft pick. I'll sign. I'll get my draft, and that's how they build that core. And and uh, how about I something you, that would call? How side. about calling the owners bluff and saying, "No, we want to put on the table no contracts more than four years." No, why? Why would you do that as a player? Uh, you would do that because that's the, well, you want to, you want, this is to me, I think this is how you expose whether actual collusion is taking place or whether they are self policing themselves. And here's why because it's not the amount of money Bryce Harper wants to make that is holding him back. Right. There's there's a half dozen teams that pay him 25, 30, 35, 40 million dollars a year right now and would have paid it this entire time. It's the years that he wants on that deal. And you players say, hey, you want you guys say, hey, we want freedom of movement. Well, one of the ways they were able to get the players association in the NFL uh, and they did this in the NBA first when they had their work stoppage in the mid 90s over this. OK, so one of the reasons they did this, uh, how they did it in the NBA and the NFL with the rookie salary cap is they made those contracts shorter term. So, for example, if Andrew Luck had come out 10 years before he did, he'd have gotten some inc- insane seven, eight year deal from uh, the team that picked him number one. But under right. the new CBA, everybody gets a three year contract with a fourth year option that the club then decides in the NFL. And that's why we're seeing more guys go pro now early is they want to get their their career clocks started earlier so that they can then hit free agency, right? Mm-hmm. So you guys want freedom of movement. The owners are afraid of how much money they're outlaying for, you know, Justin Verlander for when he's 42 years old and his arm, he can't lift it anymore, all right? Well, you know, then if, if then we'll meet you halfway, then well, we don't then no more contracts over 5 years. So, so a couple reasons. Number one, the owners would take that in a heartbeat. You think they There's would? No okay. doubt. Oh, absolutely, okay. would take that in a heartbeat. Uh, and number two, why all the players you're talking about uh, are at a point in time when they've earned the right to get what they want to get and get what they can get. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference between that and coming out of college, right? You're 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 entering uh, and and but 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 as a free agent, you've spent six years somewhere. Uh, probably, um, and you've earned the right to go out and test the waters. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what would be the incentive as a player? Because what you're seeing is a lot of player options or, or uh, buyouts, right? It's the players that, you know, I don't know why the teams are doing this. It's like no trades. They're getting burned by it every time, which is, you know, you give a guy seven years, $210 million, and he's got an option for a third or fourth year buyout when, I mean, listen, I, I get the why the, the buyouts are in there, but the fact of the matter is David Price had a buyout after, uh, I think, three years, and he was it was miserable here. He's making $22 million a year. He's not going to make that much anywhere else going out. Why would you buy yourself out? It's for the one exception that, has, you know, it's for the guy that does what uh, uh, Mike Trout has done, right? He He's had three – every well, every year of his career has been phenomenal. But, but I mean, he would be a guy that might buy him. Kershaw had it as well in, in Frisco. But the fact of the matter is the system, as the players look at it for long-term deals, is is just fine. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's the arbitration that's killing the middle class. Okay. Uh, let's go to some uh, college football recruiting and we haven't really done a lot of this on the show, but, uh, I do follow it, but I'm not the guy that, you know, I, I don't follow updates every time a coach calls a kid. I am 45 years old. I really, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, you know, I, I care about kids when, when it's clear they're about to sign and then I care about how good they are. And then I study the kids who do, but I don't, you know, that's to catch a predatory. Yeah. You know, I'm not yeah. following guys that aren't going to sign until next December. And Hey, you know, he stopped at 10. Tennessee uh, on a Thursday in March. Well, you know, I got family. I'm not going to do that. But uh, the the rivals.com is kind of the granddaddy of recruiting. Uh, and, and they really made this a national industry. And, and then others came along. Now ESPN is involved in this industry as well. And I, I'm not, I, there's the story that's going around and we're going to put it up here on the screen for those of you that are watching us. This is, um, this is about Blake Carringer, a 6'6", 315-pound offensive tackle from Grace Christian High School in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, uh, his recruiting profile says that he holds offers from Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, uh, and he was rated as a three-star on Rivals. Uh, and he shows up in the tw- in the 24-7 rankings because they have a composite, and so the minute somebody shows up in another service, it automatically shows up in theirs. Well, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, he was just a, a complete... Uh, fake. This is fake news. Some students made a fake Twitter account of this player. They didn't post any film, tweeted out that he had these offers. Rivals put him on their site as a three star, gave him a full article on his quote unquote evaluation, and they never even saw him play. And he's totally fake. Now, I, because of, recruiting is still kind of a niche thing in the, in the sports world, I think a lot of people don't understand um, the issue. Recruiting rankings, and I've, I've, been in, I've worked in this industry previously, they're so much better than they were 15, 20 years ago. And, it, and ESPN's involvement has had a lot to do with it. They invested yeah. huge resources, and that forced everybody else yep. to kind of do the same thing. And I, but I've always said this about recruiting rankings. They're really good at telling you who the best players are because they, they have camps. They get a chance to evaluate them together at camps and at all-star games. So there's a reason why rivals 24 seven and ESPN pretty much have the same top 300 kids in the country. One service may have them 78th, another may have them 29th and another one may have 185th, right. but, but they get in, they're pretty good at identifying who the best players are. Once you get beyond that though, there's no way to know who the 69th best right guard is or the yep. 84th. You know, he's got girlfriend problems, family problems. Can he academically cut it? You just don't know. All right. And and so the problem isn't so much that they got a guy into a into the database for fake. That's not really even the issue because there's so many kids. You're gonna you could you can slip something past the cracks if you wanted to. Right. It's the fact that rivals then went to the extraordinary step of rating him. All right? right. Putting a star ranking on a guy that was fake that they never evaluated. Not that he got into their database. All I right? think the more stunning thing is they wrote an evaluation. Yes. Of As, a what, th- that that's, doesn't exist. that's the fake news part. And what yes. it also tells you what the, you know, and having worked in this industry, I can tell you why they did it. Okay. Because all of a sudden a guy shows up they've never heard of and he's got a scholarship offer from Alabama. And you know what right. the, the, the management at Rivals is thinking? Dude, we look like idiots if Alabama's how offered somebody. Him? Yeah, how do we miss him? So quick, throw something up there. See, that's what everybody's everybody that's been on this story and it's gone viral the last couple of days, and rivals put out a long tweet storm apologizing for it and everything else. They've got the wrong scam. The scam isn't that in the you know, the other day I sent you a link from Ken Rosenthal about Bryce Harper. Right. Because I just yeah. saw it quick and sent it to you, and I didn't bother to look for a blue check mark. Okay. It wasn't actually his account. So yep. you can't really avoid that in this day and age. 
that's just the era in which we live. It's the fact that rivals then when it when it went to the second like it like that Ken Res- Rosenthal thing. Imagine if I send that to Aaron. And I say, hey, we're going to get this up on the air and talk about it tomorrow. And then another yeah. layer of bureaucracy never bothers to say to me, hey, that wasn't actually Ken Rosenthal. It was a dummy account. That's the point that yep. happened here. It's not the initial mistake. It's that that's what calls into question rivals credibility, that their yep. management looked at that yeah. and said, crap, Alabama's offered this kid. We got to make it look like we know what we're talking about. That, I thought, was the scammy part of this. Well, it is. And and I got to tell you, for an industry that is... Uh, you know, it is growing. It is, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's becoming one. I mean, Rivals is one of the foundational companies of this whole system this, in this existence. Um, how do you invest in them? Uh, and where do, where do, what, where do you draw the line? Mm-hmm. How many, h- how, and what, like you said, how, how far down the list am I going to trust you? Did I even have to ask that question is a problem? Yes. And, and, and when, you know, this is almost like being a, uh, uh, um, oh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, an investor, a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what they call them. Uh, you know, like a, a dummy investor. Is that what you're talking no, about? Like the guy who buys, who, who buys and sells junk and, and bonds. Makes, uh, uh, no, um, like a David Tepper, uh, uh a big, anyway, the, the, what John Henry does, right? Mm-hmm. John Henry talks about, uh, used to talk about the fact that your word is every once you lose your word oh a hedge fund are you talking about a hedge fund operator hedge fund. yes yeah. yes you're done mm-hmm. that's it you're, you're you're out and i don't know that there isn't some of the same similar feelings in the in the industry for for for, for something like this because this is it should be what happened to other newspapers when we found out usa today had writers who were just making up stories and they they got caught and they admitted and they got fired why are we thinking now that that doesn't still happen? Mm-hmm. What has made us believe that? How, and and I'm not talking about just USA Today. I'm talking about everybody. Everybody. Well, this goes it. back to Jason Blair at the New York Times 20 years ago. And then you know. Yep. yep. And and so what's to stop? And this happens in every industry. I I know for a fact it happens in in baseball because I've had stuff written about me that I know is not true. That was mm-hmm. never true. That was never even remotely referencing truth and people just pass it along you know why because it comes from a blue check mark person it comes from somebody who got duped yep and you've seen that happen the last couple of years it's with signings and stuff because of the thing very thing that happened to you people are catfishing everybody here's what it means if you want to if you're a college sports fan what this tells you is there's two kinds of teams that re- there, there were the three kinds. There's dynamic recruiters in football and there and there's 20 of those. And those 20 schools are going to be some combination of the top 10 recruiting classes almost every single year. All right. Meaning what I mean by dynamic recruiters, they're getting most of those top 300 kids that are that that are the most usually ready to play right away. Right. And then there's the bottom feeder schools, you know, your small schools. And then there's a lot of programs in the middle. You know, uh, my assistant, Todd, who's a Wisconsin grad, our producer, Aaron, who's an Iowa grad, uh, you know, those would be what we call developmental teams. And so if you ever wonder how come, you know, my programs average the 35th ranked recruiting class four years in a row, but we're in the Rose Bowl. How did we do that? Okay, it's because there's no way once you get beyond those top 300 kids, most of this is such a crapshoot. Most of it is so made up. There is no way to tell how the, the, the kids that's the 58th best center is better than the kid who's the 79th best center. And you can tell once you get beyond those kids, how reactionary the process is by the fact rivals like, Oh poop, Alabama offered a guy throw something up there that makes it look like we know what we're doing and put three stars on them. In no way, shape or form is this any different than the NFL draft. You know, I agree with that. If everybody, we, we, I've been in NFL draft, Nick, cause I'm a Mel Kuyper junior groupie. Okay. Right. No, but, I, but I, look at- I, I watch enough college football. I can tell you who the top 50, 60 prospects are. And, right, I, and, right. and most of those guys will be the first two draft picks or the who first was, two rounds. You know, we get into rounds five, six, or seven. Who the hell knows who well, the that, center at UTEP right? is? 198 play, people passed on Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. 198 times Tom Brady's name was passed over. If you go back, including the Patriots, right. five no. times passed on right. Tom no. Brady. Right. Yeah. If you go back and, 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 and they, you know, I, I'm always fascinated when they go back and redo drafts. If you go back and redo the draft. Is he not the number one pick? Yes. Right. I yeah. mean, that. so, so, and that's very much the same thing here. Is, Terrell is Davis, six? sixth round pick, Curtis yep. Martin, fourth round pick. Those guys just recently went into the Hall of Fame at well, running back, for they, example. I think you sent me a link the other day. There are more players, I saw this here, there are more non drafted players on NFL rosters than there are for, uh, players picked between the first and sixth round. Yes. 
That's, I mean, that, what does that tell you right there? Yeah. That no, it's, it's an inexact science and it always will be because the things that people want to measure, the sabermetrics people despise. You can't measure heart. You can't measure character. You can't measure want and desire. Because here's and the thing. So, if you had all those immediate, obvious physical gifts, we'd all recognize it and you'd be a top 50 or 60 prospect. You're not if, hard yeah, to identify. Yes. If, it, and that, that, <laughs> if, if you were a five star, you and I know enough about football. You know enough about athletics and great athleticism. I watch enough college football. I could go to a, to a rivals all-star camp and tell you who the five star players are. And so could you. Oh, what we couldn't I, tell you, we couldn't do what Paul Christ at Wisconsin does, which is find me the 240 pound guard that when I look at his work ethic and I look at his... <clears throat> I look at his temperament that he can fit into our culture and after three years be a starting left tackle that goes on and plays in the NFL. Yep. That's what yep. you and I could not do. And that's why guys like that make that kind of money. Yeah. And, and I mean, again, there's so many, somebody was mentioned, uh, uh the, the bears, the bears took Trubisky over Mahomes. Uh, you look at Jamarcus Russell. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, there are some Ryan leaf. I mean, the, 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 and that's why the running the 40 and all those other things, that's eyewash. That's how everybody's going to see the time and no one, you're not going to surprise anybody and be the fastest guy on earth because everybody's already seen you and caught in and stuff like that. So we didn't get fascinating. to, we didn't get to your boy, Colin Kaepernick, which I'm, I'm not, oh. I'm not putting clickbait in here. He's in the news for a legitimate reason. We will get to this though next week. And yeah. maybe it's better because on purpose, I didn't touch on the Alliance of American football this week. And here's why, because I wanted to see how their numbers showed in week two. Because the numbers in week one were really strong, but this is the week we're now going to find out whether this thing is going to catch on or not. All right. And so we'll talk some more about that on Monday. Have a great weekend, Kurt. You too.